All right, so we got Austin Zellin here. And we're going to talk all things, what, passive income, passive how you income. quit your job, how you, uh, honestly, you're a, a, you know the word autodidact? Like a self-taught individual. <laughs> so this is something that I thought was like very interesting because you've taught yourself so many things, but you screwed up a lot over your life in terms of testing the waters, trying to figure something out, lost a lot of money. Obviously, now you teach over how to do things the right way, which I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. So yes, there's a lot of uh, benefit to being somebody who's self-taught, but there's uh, a lot of benefit to not having to go through all the bullshit, all the, all the downs and all the lows, right? So that's what you do now. So why don't you uh, give like a quick summary of where you're at right now and all the different things that you've invested in that you've now sort of taught over to other people. But then also like describe your reality when you were back at Microsoft and you wanted nothing other than to quit and, and find freedom, but you didn't really know where to go because that's the reality that lies with a lot of our listeners, right? They're in a nine to five job and they're stressed out and they, they like entrepreneurship, but they don't really know where to go and what to do next. So I want to I want to understand all the stuff you're working on now, but I want to also understand your mindset when you're stuck in that and how you thought through getting out of it and basically escaping the nine to five. Let's, let's go. So it floor is yours. So what are you, what are you working on? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So right now, um, the reality is that I realized that I wanted to create my life in such a way where my time is not tied to the amount of money that I make. So I have the separation of dollars and hours. I do whatever I want with my time and I still get paid, whether I work or not. Now, do I still choose to work? Absolutely, because I love what I do, but it's a different type of work. So back then I was working at Microsoft, I was building somebody else's dream. Now I'm focused on building what I wanna build, which is an educational platform. So I'm teaching people how to create passive income I'm teaching them financial literacy. I'm showing them my journey step by step, exactly what I did from getting funding to researching different investments, analyzing investments, discovering new investments. My biggest focus is discovering investments where other people don't even see them yet. So at the cutting edge of discovering new investments. And I think what really prompted this was um, when I was at Microsoft, they're at the cutting edge of a lot of technology. They've developed a lot of tech, which is like, groundbreaking like they're developing new things that the world hasn't even seen yet and that inspired me because i'm like hey if i could find new investments that people haven't even heard of i bet we could be really successful with them and so i've kind of treated my life as like a sort of like a test for all these investments and i didn't have anybody to coach me through them but i was able to try them out one by one and i'd say i've had about a 60 to 70 percent success rate so Obviously, not every investment has been successful, individually speaking, but overall, my portfolio has performed over time. And the biggest thing that that has taught me is, number one, risk management. So how to manage my risk correctly. That's the only thing that I can control in the market. And then secondly, how to build a portfolio that produces truly passive income. So sometimes people get a little bit confused uh, with the term passive income and they just create another job for themselves. And so they're, they're ending up having to manage these investments on their own. You know, maybe they start an online store. They're having to keep a hundred boxes in their garage and they're trying to ship all of them and label them and all that stuff. And that's not really passive. Like it is another way to make money, but it's not as passive as we thought it would be. Um, but my main focus right now is continuing to scale my portfolio to be more and more um, involved in different industries. So externally diversified across different industries and also maintaining that passive income flow. So back when I was at Microsoft, I realized that, hey, I don't want to spend my entire day behind a desk consulting, um, building somebody else's dream. By the way, how old were you when you quit Microsoft? Um, I'd say it was like 21, 22. 21, 22. And how long yeah. have you been working for Microsoft? Uh, about a year and a half. Which that's actually interesting. You were right, 19 and a half or so when you joined yeah. as a consultant for Microsoft. I snuck in. I, yeah, I mean, and that was yeah. the first question I asked you before we got in here. What do you have to teach Microsoft at the age of 19 and a half that they did not already know? Yeah. It was, uh, was an interesting... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So t uh, speaking a little bit to that, as a consultant, I find that you don't really teach people things. I was using systems and frameworks that the consulting firm that I worked for had created already. And mm -hmm. I was just walking Microsoft through those frameworks. If they're like, hey, I need to solve this problem. I'm like, great, we have a framework for that. 
let me show you this four step framework that my company has created and I'll show you exactly how we can apply the information that you gave me, organize it, look at our current state, look at our future state and find the gap and then walk them through that. So, so when, when we spoke, and I'm, I'm, I'm breaking the, the routine of what you said, but we're going to get back to it. Yeah. I, I just didn't want to skip that. It was an interesting part because I, did have, I do have uh, kind of like a philosophy around agencies where they're useful, but you also have to be cautious working with agencies. And you, you mentioned where your job was to sell um, Microsoft Cloud services, and you would go to, say, Deloitte or other agencies, convince mm-hmm. them to buy it with a kick of millions if they decide to convince their portfolio of companies that hire them to tell them what should they do to improve efficiency. Yep. And if they work with the Microsoft, they'll get $10 million, which in essence you're saying, it was kind of like obviously a, a gray area, right? You expect them to be completely uh, for you when you pay them, but apparently there is a bigger paycheck above that hanging over their head saying, well, convince them to work us instead of say Amazon web service which is probably better than Microsoft. Well, you know, I don't know about that, man. <laughs> I know you're still a punch. But in general, you understand, right? But the they point is as a yeah. consultant, yeah, 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 consultant. Yeah. You're not yeah. going in as a completely impartial third party. Yeah. yeah so Deloitte would be the consultant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So um don't use Deloitte the- guys, notice that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. To speak that, to that a little bit, um, I wasn't forcing them to do that, obviously. So, like, I think the decision and the ethical decision still lies with that company. Yes. Right. If you're Deloitte's client and they decide, hey, you know, um, Microsoft will actually incentivize me if I send more business their way. But for you, I believe AWS would be a better fit because you already have AWS involved like here in this part of your business. So they could fully make that decision to send them your way. So that's on them. Do they care more about sending you to what's the best fit or does the best fit for you actually happen to be Microsoft and they get paid for it? So I don't know. I think it could be either way. I don't think it's necessarily a straight line of like, hey, AWS is better, but we'll pay you. In, ge- in general terms, for me, I think it's a, it's a point where you set yourself just to understand that just because you pay someone to consult for you doesn't mean they have their, your best interest. They might, you might be uh, deprioritized over some other decisions that they make. Above that, if, if a person comes in and he works, but their manager said, any type of uh, web, web service cloud, use this. That's what the company recommend. They might not even know they're offering you that. And this is the yeah. reasons why, and they'll probably break it down. So by the end of the day, the protocol sends uh, an employee that doesn't really know why he has to recommend that. It's probably what happens. But I think a lot of yeah. people feel that way when they're in a job, right? They're not necessarily in love with the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because even then, like, did you feel like you were that effective, like you were changing the world when you were a consultant? No, and that's one of the biggest problems that I had with it. I was just fulfilling one small role. And like, I think you mentioned that I was out there selling this cloud. I wasn't even doing that. I was just helping the team develop the strategy to sell the cloud. And in reality, there's like 30 of us. So my little piece was like tiny. It's like super unfulfilling. Yeah, super unfulfilling for the most part. What I was doing in my job, it was very automated. There are a lot of systems in place and technology that helped me do a lot of it. And I was just kind of filling in a role, right? There was some human involvement, obviously, but for the most part, it was very unfulfilling for me. And I felt like I could provide so much more value, whether it's to Microsoft or to more of a private client. Um, And that's what kind of led me down that transition. You continue after that with Forex, right? That was your first breakthrough where you yeah. said, okay, I'm, I'm going to have financial independence. I don't have to get their salary. I can be my own boss. And you went on Forex and you built an Algobat trading. How long was it? You know, how long ago was it? Yeah, so I was building a bot throughout that whole time. So even while I, when I first started at Microsoft, I was already trading Forex. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just explain. Algobat trading yeah. is... Uh, Instead of being a day trader, coming in and out, you just systemize based on the strategy, uh, the trades, and you build a bot that knows how to do it better than a human if you stick to a particular strategy. Correct me if I'm, cor- if I'm wrong. But yep. you, you didn't, so he didn't build that day one. So what you did is you were a trader, yep. and then you documented your process, yep. and then you took that and you found a developer to build that into a bot. So he became exactly. a trader first yes. and then built the bot second. How long was, uh, when, what year was it? 
when you build the bot, when the bot was already, you press the button and it starts making you money. So it first started when I was 19. So I was already using the bot back then. That was five years ago, two years ago. Six uh, years ago. Six years ago, okay. Yeah. So I was already using the bot, at probably closer to like 20 years old, but in, in I was still 19. Mm-hmm. I was using the bot and that first year, I just used it on my own funds. So I didn't have any client money being traded, just my own funds. I was like, hey, let's try this out and see what happens. But before that, I've been trading since I was 18. Mm. So I was trading um, for the first, I don't know, nine to 12 months. It was just very unprofitable, right? I was trying to figure out how can I be consistent with this? How can I figure before out- Before the bot. Before the bot, okay. yeah. How can I figure out how to even make money with Forex? So eventually, once I figured that out, I'm like, okay, this is great. Let me start trading. And I started building up some capital, just trading myself. Now, during this time, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, you know, this is kind of creating an additional job for me. So what if I just found a way to transition to full-time investor? You know, I'm already working at Microsoft. This is great, but it's boring. How can I transition out of Microsoft and be a full-time investor? And so for me, that was the software, right? With the software, I realized that I could automate my whole investment process if I could just set it into rules. I have several rules that happen, mathematical calculations, and I found a team that can take all my rules and put it into code. They write it all into code, and now I have this automated system. And so I'm using this system to trade my capital. I have proven that it's profitable, and now I'm like, okay, well, let me take on clients. So I started taking on clients and allowing them to subscribe to my software. What do you mostly trade on? You mentioned gold. What else do you trade on? Is it we just- trade uh, five currency pairs for the most part, um, but also gold. So the most common ones that we trade is euro to Swiss, euro to US dollar, euro to Japanese yen, New Zealand dollar to Canadian dollar, and US dollar to Japanese yen. Okay, so so we don't speak Chinese over here to some of our uh, <laughs> listeners. The, the idea is to buy and sell and arbitrage uh, money where you actually try to gain uh, can i ask as like an entrepreneurial obviously you have a very entrepreneurial mindset i I don't know where you're going with that but i have another question before we no i just i just (laughs) want to make sure that people don't get lost scott i want i want them to understand what is uh, forex what is forex it's a platform my question does no, it just that. yeah. I, I don't want people to uh, to listen. Those who I did not know what it is up until a few months ago myself. So it's it's something that not everybody understands. So no, it's a very it's interesting a, concept. Yeah. You're trading against foreign currency. So yes. foreign currency fluctuates up and down, like stocks, like any investment, and you're taking advantage of those fluctuations in the market. Exactly. Um, but my question to you, obviously, you're very entrepreneurial. Why, when you're working at Microsoft, did you want to go into forex in the first place? Because that seems like a highly risky thing. So out of all the million things, if you think about it, like six years ago, um, I actually, we, you know, we were talking about, before, about this before, I would have thought like as an entrepreneurial passive income individual, you would have done uh-huh. drop shipping or you would have done something that was more mainstream. So where was your head at? Why did you want to go into Forex? What, how did you see that and recognize that opportunity when you, you never came from a background in, in investment banking or trading or, or finance even? Yeah. Um... So there's kind of an interesting story to that. And it was one of my buddies, he showed me basically how to place a trade. And this wasn't even a real like trading account, it was a demo account, which means you have paper money in there, not real money. And he just showed me how to place a trade. And I remember thinking it was like the coolest thing ever. I'm like, whoa, like I'm trading Forex, right? And so after that, I like, I placed a couple trades on my own, just really tiny trades. And I didn't even know what I was doing, like lot size, no idea what the heck I'm doing, like nothing. And I was hanging out with a friend, just catching up with a friend that I hadn't seen in a while. And I'm like, dude, like our other friend, our mutual friend showed me how to trade this Forex thing. You want to see? He was like, yeah, sure. We're like sitting in Starbucks, middle of the afternoon. And I just place a trade. And I was so out of the loop that I totally forgot that I placed the trade. And later that evening, I was going to watch like a lesson or something on Forex. And I opened my app and I made like $2,000. And I'm like, whoa. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the motivation. That's yeah, what changes yeah, yeah. your that life. Is oh, motivation. Yeah. That, that's your like, like, moment. Good. Imagine if I actually knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <okay. laughs> like, and what, <laughs> So that was the moment when I realized I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to learn this. Because it was so fascinating to me that with no skill set, I was able to make $2,000. Now imagine if I knew what I was doing and what blew my mind is two things. Number one, there are people out there with the same iPhone that I have pressing buttons on their phone and making instead of 2,000, they make 200,000 in the same day, the same move. All that's different is their lot size is different. The size of their trade is just a little bit bigger. Yeah. They didn't have to have any bigger skill than I do. They just had a bigger account. 
So I was committed that I was going to learn that skill set. And as I started learning, then I realized that the markets are actually very fascinating. They're so correlated with each other. All these different currencies, all the reversal points, they're they're correlated, right? And they move literally in rhythm. Like there's you can map out the entire movement of a certain currency based on technical analysis. Technical analysis plays right into fundamental analysis. It's so fascinating to me how the markets just line up perfectly right before a news event happens. And when a news event happens, we see maybe a reversal or a continuation through a huge resistance point, right? And it's all timed to the T. It's exact. And I love that. I love the exactness of the market. Yeah, I think when, when you, I mean, after my exit, I decided to learn just like you. Yeah. Um, because I was focused on one thing. And and I, I noticed that when you look at any kind of trade platform, if it's around crypto or stocks or if it's going to be gold, whatever it is, if it's uh, commodities, it's um, it's very much around traders, right? So if, if you're looking at commodities, the fluctuation is less because there's just a lot of trade not around investors. Yeah. But as soon as you involve investors around this, with crypto, it's much more volatile, but ultimately what goes down, everything goes down, goes down, up, everything goes up. Mm -hmm. and, and you can measure based on the volatility, the amount of investors compared to actual trade around the stock, the, the, the commodity, the, the currency. Yep. And you can say, okay, if, if it's just mostly investors, maybe it's a little bit more risky because of whatever in the future might be different. Right now, it's, it's an empty shell for now. And, and that's how you look at this. So when people thought that crypto is or Bitcoin is going to be the savior in an inflation, you saw that it was not the case. It was just, it was just a disappointment. Mm -hmm. because it went down just with, as the market went down. Everything mm -hmm. crushed together. It was not saving inflation or anything like that. That was against everything, that they, at least for now. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you have only investors trading, a big amount of the trade is just around investors, it's just a musical game. When it goes down, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, like you said, for now, that's what we see. I think it still has the potential to at least hedge against inflation, crypto in general, because of certain qualities does it, that it has. But um, yeah, you know, it's very volatile. It's a very volatile market. I personally don't trade crypto. Mm -hmm. It's unpredictable to me. Whereas if I'm trading euro versus Japanese yen, that, those currencies have existed You can go for five so years and track <laughs> the movements. You can exactly. predict where you're going to be. Yeah. I know every time it hits this number, it's going to bounce from it. It's just yeah. that's how it is, you yeah. know. So that's what I like about it. I like the predictability of it. Um, and as you like see more of the market and you understand the psychology behind it, that's the biggest thing. I find that trading is very simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because of the psychology and all the, the mind games that you go through as a trader. And you have to understand why the market is moving a certain way, why your trade didn't play out, why it should play out. And trusting your system is the biggest thing. So if you have a profitable system, and you're net positive over, let's say, 100 trades, you just have to trust it, even if you're losing trades. And, um, and the, the other thing that struck me when we had our pre-interview discussion, you were talking <laughs> to me about your other side today, where you have 50% in, in uh, coins and in, in gold that you trade. But, in Forex, uh, in yeah. Forex, Forex but yeah. then you have also another 50% in a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. One of them was very fascinating, and I was the oil wells you buy wells yeah just what <laughs> it's like Saudi Arabia over here so you go to Texas yep there is a, a mining company that drills yeah and one out of 50 you only lose the rest you're gonna start pumping oil and you're gonna make what is 12 percent a month on your money after I'd say done. 7 to 12 is usually what we're seeing on the wells um obviously that's like past performance um but yeah, you know, I don't physically go down to Texas. Sometimes I do to go check on them. Like I'm going down there next week, actually, funny enough. Um, but yeah, I'd say I go maybe like once a year just to kind of see how things are going, get some content. Uh, but for the most part, these are wells that are like supplying oil to major refineries. So the key is you want to work with somebody who's been in the industry for a while because the good plots of land where there's lots of oil and there's lots of flow of oil, 
those are usually only accessible through like generational stuff, right? So this dude's dad or his grandpa owned this land and he passed it on to them. Because if you're not getting generational access, you're not getting access to the best land, mm -hmm. right? So you have to have some sort of relationship there or it's going to be very expensive to the point where you're not really profiting that much. How did you get to it? Well, I want, I want to actually, I want to, I want everyone to understand your, your, I guess, life thesis and your investment thesis, which is like fractional business ownership, but fractional to the point where you don't have to have a complete understanding of yeah. the actual business mechanics and operations. Yeah. So I wanna, cause that actually, uh, that permeates every single business he does. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't do a bit like he, that's a true passive income. That was the, that was your income. point. You're saying, well, you don't have to actually do the drilling. You don't have to go with those fine shoes and start uh, doing the drilling and managing the selling of the oil. You just go through a company that that's their job, and they just need that that a million bucks to go in and start drilling. And then, okay, you bought the land with other partners. You own a fraction of multiple wells. One out of so are going to find nothing dirt, but the rest will pay, and ultimately you're pumping oil and you're a partner and you don't have to manage anything. You just get the check in the bank. Exactly. So I think that the scariest part of investing for people is managing the investment. And so what I've found is a group of like professional, professional people, specialists at what they do. So like this oil, war, for example, these guys have been doing it for 30, 40 years. That's the only thing that they do. All they do is drill oil all day. They know exactly how to do it. If I spent the next 30 years how to do it, I don't know if I'd be as good as them because they have that in their in their family. So That's how does someone goes to you and say, here's some money, cut me in. I want to get some oil. Yeah, let me get there Business. in a second. <laughs> let me get there in a second. So um, to create this a truly passive income stream, right? To create truly passive income, we have to find specialists. These specialists are really good at what they do and they do one thing. I don't want to get that good at drilling well, oil wells. I don't really care about it that much. But if I can purchase a well and give it to them to manage or pay them to drill a well for me and they manage the whole thing, you bet they're going to do as good as they possibly can because number one, they're incentivized on performance so they get a profit split. And number two, that's their entire livelihood. If they don't produce oil, they don't have food or you know, and clothes reputation and reputation and they can't pay their mortgages. Like That's their entire investment all their time and energy goes into producing profitable oil wells there is no possible chance that i would ever commit that much time to doing it so for me the best option is to become an investor i invest into an oil well they run it for me and i'll split the profits with them all day long i, I bet i go to work my kid how did you get into it <laughs> how i met this guy how, yes. how you how you yeah so after how did forex, you end up okay. going into yeah from forex all yeah. the way to seattle because you just went found into you just texas found, like and, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it's so, a gold mine super impressive like cash flowing opportunities is basically what the end result is but yeah you, and you that's all relationship yeah i've found that these are all people in my network and if i don't know somebody like maybe i want somebody that i don't know has a helicopter company i don't know anybody but maybe you do maybe you can introduce me you know what i mean yeah. so it's all relationship and i know that if yosef trusts them I, I can trust them too i think he's a solid guy he's obviously business savvy as i am <laughs> <laughs> he is i promise but <laughs> no so i would trust his opinion you know if he tells me somebody's solid that's a way more significant thing than me finding some guy on the internet that's like hey invest in my helicopter yeah. company i know what you can do with marketing and i understand that a relationship and somebody's word is way more valuable than that so i focus a lot on developing these relationships and i find ways that i can provide value to people and a lot of times they're like hey you know i was thinking of um this guy that runs a helicopter company and you came to mind let me introduce you guys right so it's all building a network and whether it works out or not you know that's a whole different story but for me, it's relationships. And so my first passive income investment was actually Bitcoin mining. And that was also through a relationship. Mm. So there was this guy that I knew back in network marketing way back in the day. He started like investing into Bitcoin miners. And he's like, hey, man, like, you know, a long time. No what see, year let's was chat. it? Uh, I think it was like 18, 19 back then. Yeah, okay. it was a while back. Yeah. So we started mining Bitcoin back then. Um, and we... He basically introduced me to this guy, the CEO of this company that 
mines Bitcoin. And so I started buying up miners and I'm like, oh, this is great. I don't do anything. And that was my first taste of passive income because for trading, I still had to trade for the most part. But I started building out this portfolio with miners. And then I went to their event. I talked to people there. I met other people that have other investments and developing that network allowed me to find all these other people. So oil wells, exotic cars, um, Airbnbs, like I'm always actively looking for professionals who are the best in their industry, the best guy in oil, the best guy in real estate, the best guy in Airbnbs, the best guy in Amazon stores, right? So finding the best in their industry, connecting with them, vetting them, investing myself, if it works out, then I put it into my program that Mm -hmm. I teach on. So if it fails, obviously it doesn't make it, but my goal is to simplify that process for people to where I do all the due diligence. They don't have to go out and lose if they can just copy my winners. So it's kind of like trading signals, but in the investment world. Do you know why I'm fascinated? Because, you know, I guess for my end, and I know it's got the same thing. Uh, We're kind of like business operator. We run a business, we build it, then broker back to sell it. I mean, and I still have back pains. And it's 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 fascinating when you're young and you have already a whole multiple streams of income from real passive income. It's nothing, more, it's not like, okay, I'm renting a place, but I have to clean it and manage it. No, no, it was organized, it was structured, it was all, you have car rental, you have now jet, you have uh, rental, and y- you have multiple streams of income and uh, from Airbnb to, even petroleum it's just it was it was fascinating to see that you actually made a an you made a a goal for yourself to make sure you don't have to get your hands dirty mm-hmm. just looking for the opportunities and buying more and more and more and putting a dollar to make two and and move on and it was just there's always something else whatever you do there's always another opportunity out there it's just it's yeah. not it's not everything there's always something else it can be bigger it can be different Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, that's that's part of my strategy, diversifying. So I don't go all in on one investment. I diversify it into multiple different things, both internally and externally. I was telling Scott earlier, like, let's say even exotic cars. I'm not buying just one Lambo and that's it. I'm done. No, I'm buying a Lambo. I'm buying a Lambo SUV. I'm buying a Rolls Royce. I'm buying a Ferrari. So internally within that sector. Did you have like sector, failures on this? Oh, that's not a good car. I shouldn't have done this. Or you knew in advance before you got in? I knew in advance because I talked to the guys that have been operating this for five, six years. Oh. So they know. They can show me their data for the past five years, how much this car makes every month. So I'm like, oh, I want that one. I want this one. Tell us about the car business. How are you making money with that? Yeah. So uh, basically we're buying these exotic cars about 20 to 30K down. Um, sometimes a little bit more, just kind of depending on your credit and how much other stuff you're financing. Um, you send the car to them and that's it. Then they direct deposit you all the profits that you make. So they do all the maintenance, all the management, all the cleaning, literally A to Z, they handle the car. That's their whole business. They're the best at it. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads every month that I don't have to spend, but that's because that's their business. So if they have this machine that's already running, why would I rebuild it? I'm just going to take a car or 10 cars and place it in their business and let them rent it out for me. And they're going to want 50% of the profits, right? Maybe 60. I'm fine paying that. I don't do anything. I just get direct deposits every month. And these cars, depending on the city. Now, I've heard some people doing like 50 to $70,000 a month on these cars. I think that's very location specific. So far, what I've seen from our vendors, like real numbers, 30 to 40K on the better months. So if you're doing 40K on a Lambo in a month and you do a 50-50 split, I put 20K down and I just made 20K in one month. That's, that's a real good investment. Pretty good, yeah. That's yeah. insane. And, and, uh, that's no, that, that's insane. Be, beyond good. This is when it's a real business and it's yeah. not. But you know why though? Because all you're doing, so, so they have the model in place. Yeah. So to replicate that yourself, you'd need years of experience, trust mm-hmm. with your customers, millions of dollars in advertising budget. Mm-hmm. You're, just, you're just saying like, listen, you have 100 cars, I'm going to finance the 101st car and you just throw it into your machine. Yeah. You already have. Yeah, because everyone would think that it all goes to regular traditional real estate rental. Where you make yourself 5% a year, 10% a year if you're really good at buying the property, but you still have to manage that. So then you have to, and maybe some form of the appreciation if you're in a bull market. But yeah, uh, hey, yeah that's, that's a whole different ball game. Oh, um, yeah. And that, what that provides me also is predictability. I'm not speculating. How is this car going to do? I wonder how much I'm going to make. No, I could just look at the data, what they've done for the past six years. And it usually lines up. Like, oh, yeah. And you've met, and the people that you've met 
they're honest, they're not screwing you over. Because like yep. now you're giving up a little bit of control too, because you're yeah. placing an expensive asset. You don't know what's actually happening. So you got to yeah. trust these people. Exactly. Yeah. So both of the vendors that I use, um, I have vetted them thoroughly. So I've spent maybe six to 12 months before I ever placed the car there, just doing research on them, just getting to know them, taking them out to dinner, understanding how their model works, why it works that way, understanding the ins and outs of their business. And once I had a relationship with them where I trust them, I'm like, okay, well, let's place a car here. And I did it first myself. I put a car there and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now it's profitable. Let me place a second car. Let's see what happens. And I just grew it step by step by step. And eventually I had built up enough trust and results to where I can send my students their way. How many how many cars do you have over there? Um, I currently have five. Five cars. Yeah. So don't you think that eventually it's going to, I mean, you're going to have to find more of those dealerships in different cities because... No, not really. Um, you know, I thought about that. However, most of these people were such like my group of investors is such a significant part of their company at this point that mm. they're opening more locations just because we're sending them so many cars. Mm. So like we have, let's see, New York, this guy in New York has multiple locations on his own, mm. right? Even without us, he has New York, Miami, LA, um, and we have Seattle as well. So we have like locations that we have as core core markets and then we have locations that we can expand to so like right now tampa is really hot nobody's really doing it in tampa so we're always finding new markets that we mm. can move to and develop and we're still so early on in this game of course eventually it's going to become saturated like miami personally in my opinion but then you already paid off the cars yeah yeah and and that's why i'm also moving into other investments the jet yeah. nobody's doing jets yet People are starting to catch on about the cars. People are starting to invest in that, right? We also have semi-truck automation. That's another thing. Nobody's doing that, right? Well, there are a couple of people in the game, but... Semi-truck automations? Automation, Splendid. yeah. It's just like exotic cars. You buy a semi-truck, you give it to a semi-truck company, they put an operator in there and they do deliveries. Huh. And you make about... Because they couldn't finance that many additional trucks. That's the thing. It's like They have a limit on how much they can personally finance and personally guarantee based on business yeah. performance. Yeah. So we're helping them grow their business. They love us. We're doing about, I'd say, semi-trucks, 8 to 12K a month. I, I kind of like it a little bit better than exotic cars because exotic cars, I'm thinking about kids that made some money on crypto and now they're messing up your car versus a truck. That's what that is, is for. Uh, yeah, that is what Yeah, I mean, is. but still, I mean, depreciation faster. No, apparently they appreciate too. Well, not, not, I mean, not if you crush it. Well, no, but then you get an insurance payout, then you yeah. buy a new one. Well, I still. like it that it's a physical asset, very low risk. Yeah. You know, if I if I'm trading forex, there's nothing guaranteeing it. But in the car, at least I own the physical asset. So if the if the market goes to shit and the business gets kicked off Facebook and they can't run ads anymore anymore at all, then you still have a physical asset you can sell. You still own it, yes. Yeah. Well, well with drugs, I mean they depreciate, but at the same time they drive slower, they they're very careful, less accidents on trucks, right? So I mean, yeah. and it's, it's gonna pay insurance. itself off if it's you're saying twelve percent a month, did I hear correctly? Not twelve percent, I'd say it's actually month. higher than twelve percent. No, he said he said eight to twelve K we're buying with yeah. the assets that you have under management right now. Yeah, eight to twelve K per truck. So this is how it works. We're essentially buying these semi trucks around 25 to 50K. So somewhere within that range. We're not buying brand new. You don't want to do that. I don't want to take the depreciation hit. Ah, if you want to do okay. it, you can do that. I'm oh, not doing that. That's the strategy. No, I, that's strategy. Scott, I, don't, I don't do that. Scott loves to depreciate his ass. I mean, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <fine. laughs> well, I'll buy three trucks while he depreciates his one. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> no, so we're buying, let's say, 30K, 40K for a truck, right? And this truck does. Twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month gross top of line revenue. Now off of that, we're expensing obviously the, what we're paying the driver, the fuel, yeah. all the maintenance, everything, and you're left with usually about after all the profit splits, about eight to twelve thousand dollars net. So if I invested forty thousand dollars and I'm making twelve k a month, well, it's about twenty five percent a month. Right. Wow. wow. How many trucks do you have? I just have two. Okay. Yeah. You watch out. He's going to buy, he's going to buy 3,000 trucks. <laughs> make a f I we'll, got we'll, to finish this we'll, podcast. We'll talk yeah. after this. <laughs> yeah. How many trucks are there in Florida? Right? Yosef yeah. is the largest individual private owner of semi-trucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill Gates like, style, but <laughs> yeah. He just, he just changes his Instagram bio. Like the semi -truck? trucking automation. Yeah. Truck. Joe Trucker. No, yeah. Joe the Trucker. No. Joe yeah. the Trucker. <laughs> That's no, incredible. There's, there's a lot of opportunity and stuff like that. And that's something that most people never think of. 
Yeah. And so the way I see my role is like, I know all these people, like I personally have known this guy running trucking automation for years. Like this is a personal friend. For me, I trust him, right? And so I know that he's gonna do an excellent job running this. And so it's very easy for me to give him multiple trucks. I'm just thinking my friends has a podcast and here I am doing a podcast when your friends have those awesome ideas of you. Why couldn't you do trucks and <laughs> Listen, tell me man, about this? Stuff? I, I have a podcast, so you have an awesome idea see every week, okay? to us, You have an awesome idea every week. <laughs> I give you two um, points, you're right. Yeah. You're right yeah. yeah, so, you know, and I'm my job is to develop those relationships further, right? And then I, I hand them off to my group of investors and I think that's the biggest value you know, for most people is like, what should I invest in? How does it work? Well, do you have, um, you have now uh, be between trucks, <laughs> I'll bring you, I'll bring you on a truck. If it doesn't go, I'll get you on a Lambo and then we go yeah. on a jet. That was yeah. that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, you do Airbnb yeah. still? Yep, I do Airbnbs. So I, we do a lot of Airbnb arbitrage in my program. Um, and that's a really cool model because you don't even have to own any real estate, but you don't, uh, you don't get any of the appreciation. So, so arbitrage, explain that. Yeah, so let's say you have a house in Tampa. And in Tampa right now, prices are still fairly low. Um, I can get a house for rent there on a monthly basis for like $2,000 a month. Okay. And let's say I get a contract for three years or four years. And the homeowner is happy. They're like, oh, great. You want to rent the house for four years? I don't have to do any work for four years. And then you sublease it on, on that. Yeah, and then you agree with them that you're going to sublease it on Airbnb on a nightly basis. I can charge 200 bucks a night all day long. So if I'm paying $2,000 a month, I have a management company running it. My occupancy is, let's say, 75%, which is, I believe, like 23 days out of the month. All right, 23 days times $200. That's what, uh, $4,600 $4, a month. Minus, let's say, 600 in expenses, $2,000 um, on my mortgage or my lease payment. I'm still netting two grand. And at worst case scenario, you just lose your deposit if you have to pull out in case exactly. it doesn't work, in case they de-license you from, from Airbnb exactly. and so on. That, 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 that's actually very smart. And that's my favorite part. Yeah. yeah. They probably risk. don't even notice the contract uh, where it says that. Because if you send them the contract, they're saying, well, I don't want parties. I just want to rent it to a traditional person. But yeah, here, you, see, that's the here thing. comes you. don't even you. have to worry about parties yeah. because Airbnb already bans parties. So Airbnb has insurance. Yeah. So yeah. as long as you're not violating terms of service for Airbnb, yeah. then yeah. you make sure you're not. If the homeowner's okay with it, anything they do to the house is covered under Airbnb's insurance. Yeah, absolutely. And they're responsible for it. And they're actually pretty good at enforcing those fees getting paid. Like, let's say they break my wall. Like, they're going to pay for it. The guest is going to pay for it. They're very good about that, Airbnb in general. But So you had people breaking <coughs> walls for... No, I haven't. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> if that did happen. <laughs> well, you know, the... Um, and the thing with uh, w when it comes down to Airbnb, I mean, it's it's actually interesting because if you rent, if you have a house, right? Most people don't know about Airbnb, but short-term rentals sometimes you can de-license a house from getting short-term rentals. It happens uh, in multiple places. That we have uh, someone in our neighborhood that be getting too many complaints, and they keep knocking on my doors asking me to sign because they need two more signatures so they can de-license them, and they'll have to move into long-term rentals. Mm. And uh, the guy had multiple homes, and that's what he does. He buy a couple of those homes, kind of like mine style house, and he rent them for high rollers, I guess. And uh, and it, I told him no. I mean, he's my neighbor. I don't hear any noise. There's just a couple uh, people that maybe they're positioning from the house. They feel the noise or something like that. But I told him I'm not gonna do it. Uh, but uh, but yes, some of them get the license, and at that point, you're just losing your deposit. Exactly. Well, I'm pretty sure all of Boca cannot have Airbnbs, if I'm not mistaken. So you got really, yeah. And I, I think it's Boca. It's either yeah. Boca or Deerfield. Huh. One of the two spots. The entire area defined by the the city limits cannot have Airbnbs in it. Oh, so wow. That's a city decision. So you got to make sure that obviously, if you do this, yeah, you got to make sure county regulations yeah. that you're following them. County, Sometimes yeah. they say, hey, we have a minimum of 30 days. So if you get a 30-day Airbnb, you can still do that. Or seven yeah. days, right? As so long as you break But it, it lowered your pool of, of uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely lowers it. But uh, back to your point, that is such a great risk management strategy. Because guess what? If we have a global pandemic and Airbnb shuts down, <laughs> all that's at no risk is deal, my deposit. Yeah. Yeah. But if I'm the homeowner and I own 100 houses, I still have to make my mortgage payments. Yes. And a lot of people lost houses because of that. 
because they had to make those mortgage yeah, payments. On your, yeah, the yeah. bank, the bank's going to come after you a lot harder than a, than exactly. a landlord. That's yeah. for sure. Exactly. And those lease, those deposits, a lot of times you can negotiate them. Let's say they have like, hey, an early termination fee of 10 grand. Well, maybe I can negotiate it down to five or three. Or mm -hmm. maybe the homeowner likes me and he's like, you know what, whatever, don't even pay it. So it's not even set in stone. There is a fee usually assigned to it, like an early termination fee, but Actually, it's, it's not set in stone. It's usually, it's usually just find new tenants. That's yeah. usually it, anyways. Many times, if you find if you, a new tenant, they don't give a yeah. shit because they, they don't want somebody who can't pay. Yeah. yeah, they don't need that. Why would yeah. they have that headache going to court? You know how long it is to evict somebody. It depends yeah. on the state you're in. Nope, By that time, you that keep headache. doing Airbnbs and you're cashing out while well, they're trying to evict you. <laughs> well, that would be, to yeah. evict you. <laughs> That's probably not the best luck, but like. <laughs> Yeah. So anyways, but one thing that I want to mention about that is that you're missing out on all the appreciation. So like my real estate in the Tampa area has appreciated over 30% in the past 12 oh, months. Yes. I would have missed out on that if I'm doing arbitrage, but I can get into each house for less than 5k. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at it. Hey, am I just going to do volume and do arbitrage and make a ton of money like that? Because I'm in 5k, but I'm doing $2,000. You're losing some of the upside on this one. Yeah. yeah I'm losing but it's upside. About your risk tolerance. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's still a good strategy because at a certain point, I feel like if you have enough volume on arbitrage properties, you're going to make up for any losses that you would have made for appreciation just by cash flow. Because if you're putting in five, five K, maybe seven K for a property, you can even rent furniture, by the way, you don't have to buy it. Um, and yeah, you're right. netting two grand a month from each house at a certain point, that's going to outpace your appreciation. So. I mean, especially you don't have to finance, worry about mortgages, all the stuff that would limit your ability to buy, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually rented furniture when I moved out. And it was uh, easier because I knew I'm not going to stay in that apartment. I wonder what the profit on this. I had to rent a TV for a hundred bucks a month or so on. I mean, imagine no, but the you all, you all calculate. So now, now when you, if you do this as a living, you probably have a spreadsheet where you put all the numbers in and you figure out yeah. the exact profit and you know exactly mm -hmm. what you're going to make. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that goes into negotiating these properties. So at this point, at the very beginning, I was negotiating these on my own. So if I was doing an arbitrage, I would negotiate it on my own. At this point, we have a vendor that does that for us. They're professionals. They're trained on getting you the best deal possible. On Airbnb arbitrage. Airbnb arbitrage. Yeah. And so you basically contract them. They go out and they find you a property wherever you want. They agree with the owners. They negotiate with them. They're like, hey, we're going to do Airbnbs here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And they, they have them sign this agreement for you. And so now you're fully protected. You're like, you're all set up to run this business. All you do is you sign the lease, you pick up the keys and that's it. And you just make your lease payment every month. Well, to make uh, one more point, I guess, from listening, uh, one thing you can add is uh, buy, buy out options. So you can buy the house if it appreciates at a particular rate. So you can say, I'm locking you out. Think about it. You know, if you can throw it into the contract. And it's like a lease to buy. Yeah, lease to buy. I'll yeah. buy it from you if you feel like the there was appreciation. The buy option, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting, yeah. right? That's smart, yeah. You see, it's, com it's good coming to a podcast. I mean, we're kind of <laughs> smart people, Scott and myself. Yeah, man. See, now, now, now you don't want those trucker friends, do you? <laughs> no, no, no. See? <laughs> no, 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 no. see? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you've built all these different passive income opportunities. Um, I do like talking about the ones that fail because when, when you just walk through all the wins, it sounds great, but that's not reality. Yeah. So you, you said you kept stuff out of your portfolio. So walk through mm -hmm. like some of the stuff that didn't work out and, and why is that? And also like red flags for people that are starting to go out on their own. Maybe they haven't consumed your content. Maybe they're like, you know, I don't care about Austin. I'm going to figure it out on my own first and at least give them some advice so they can not flounder too much and not screw up too much. So yeah, yeah, yeah. where should you stay away from when you're trying to build passive income? So some guidelines that I follow, and I'll go into an example here in a second, but a couple of guidelines that I follow is I like to know the owners personally. So whoever's operating this investment, I have to know them, I have to like them, and most of all, understand their investment philosophy. If they have no investment philosophy, if they're just like, hey, we're just gonna make a lot of money, it's usually not gonna work out. They have to have some sort of good like background to why they're the best person to do this. For example, my oil wells guy, his dad has been doing it for 30 years. I know this is the best guy to do it. My um, exotic car rental guy is one of the best in the entire Pacific Northwest. I know he's the best person to do that. So I understand the way he invests into his business and he has a lot of reinvestment to continue in growing that business. So for me, I trust him because of that. I like his philosophy. 
Um, another thing is that usually if an investment, and this is kind of like totally random, something that I look for, if an investment is less than 10K, you can get in for less than 10K, it's usually not legit. <laughs> and I don't know, like not to attack anybody personally, but for me personally, whenever I've invested and there was an option to put in less than 10K, it just didn't work out. And I don't know if that's just my luck or what, but what I've found is that if an investment is truly worth it, it's usually somewhere higher, like 50K, 100K, 250K. That's when you start seeing the better tier investments because they Real are returns, targeting. As opposed to like yeah. scammy, low level yeah, targeting. Yeah, like, hey, mm -hmm. yeah. give me 6K and I'm going to give you 500 Or even 000. give me like a thousand bucks and I'm going to give you insane yeah, yeah. returns. Yeah. Yeah, because they're going for people for impulse buys, right? Yeah. And I'm not looking for that because if you're offering an investment at $100,000, you're going to get some sophisticated investors who are really really doing their due diligence and you can't just sell air you have to have like legitimate results you have to be doing something right in order to ever sell a product like that or get an investment right so those people are operating at a different level because of the investor caliber that they're targeting and so for me that's usually where the better deals are and so there's a smaller pool, first of all, I don't have to weed through a bunch of garbage. Um, I can just go directly to the good deals and it's pretty easy to spot them at that point. Like you can see who's legit, who's not legit, right? Um, but anyways, back to the failed investments. Um, one of the biggest fails in my career has been um, in e-commerce. And it's not just me personally, the whole industry just kind of like really shriveled up from where it used to be. Um, everybody was selling like Walmart automation and Amazon automation. This is not to attack anybody personally, this is more of like, hey, Amazon really pulled back the reins on how many people can drop ship. And that's because that's in violation of their terms of use. And so it's a great idea. The concept is nice. It, it works out, but this is how it works. Let's say you sell something on Amazon.com or Walmart.com as a drop shipper. You sell it for 20 bucks. Let's say you sold me this glass for 20 bucks. And I'm like, oh, what a great glass. I buy it for 20 bucks. Now you take that $20 and you turn around and you go to like Target target.com you find this glass on target.com for eight dollars or twelve dollars and you ship it directly to me and you collected the difference usually you would have a team operating that so that eight dollar margin you'd split it 50 50 with them so they make four bucks you make four bucks you did nothing they just used your credit card now the cool thing about that is you don't have to hold any inventory you're only spending money when i've already paid you so it's very convenient, very easy to set it up, very easy to have somebody else operate the entire business model for you. Now, the reason that it got shut down is because I would get a box from Target and I'm like, what the heck? I bought something on Amazon.com, not Target. Why am I getting a Target box? And I probably wouldn't care, but there are people who do care and they're gonna complain about your store. As soon as you get three complaints, Amazon is like, you're drop shipping? No, we're shutting you down. And if they had money that they were about to pay you out, because they pay out um, not like every day, it's usually like bi-weekly or monthly. If they're paying you out bi-weekly, well, guess what? All your money is locked up in there, right? And so now maybe you had $200,000 of orders that you fulfilled the last month and you didn't get your payout. Well, now you're gonna have to find ways to pay that back, right? And they're holding it for months and months sometimes, sometimes six months, right? So there's all these different things that happen and they really pulled back the reins on people on Amazon and on walmart.com. So my stores just got totally shut down. I've had like five or six stores that got shut down. And these stores, they're usually about 50 grand, 40, $50,000 just for somebody to set the store up for you. So that's been a big fail for me. And um, so the reason that that failed to go into that is because it's against the terms of use. So Amazon is kind of like this big, I always compare it to a strip mall. It's like a mall, right? Yeah. You go to the mall and you have all these little stores and you're just one of those little units in the stores. And if Amazon decides that they don't like you, they can kick you out at any time. You don't really. Uh, need I will, much I will to just say because we we did have actually two Amazon uh, sellers over but here. They drop did, shipping. They did FBA. Exactly. Yeah. They did not. Do, the drop shipping. Yeah. The the hack for drop shipping. What they're doing now is they'll they send it to an intermediary yeah, midi, uh, uh, intermediary warehouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the ones that are actually doing it right that don't have any concern of sh getting shut down are the ones that actually own the goods. Yep. They, they don't drop ship from AliExpress or anything like that. They own the goods. Yeah. And what they'll do is they'll sell it. They're, there's just, I can sell it through multiple stores and do it better than versus one store and all that volume. So they'll sell it to you. And exactly like like Scott mentioned. So the the yeah. other Amazon, I mean, you you went to the wrong company apparently. The the other ones that I think within a year and a half you get your money back, which is it's a pretty awesome payout right mm -hmm. now for FBA. But it still is. I mean, with FBA, unless you're paying a management company, 
that's not passive. Oh, no, no, absolutely. That's, you a, hell have to, a, that's yes. a hell of a lot of work. No, no, absolutely. Warehouse yeah, space, so I have FBA inventory, stores as well. massive capital okay. investment. Yeah. yeah, I have FBA stores as well. Those are up and running. Yes. I'm talking about drop shipping specifically. Yes. Oh, hell, those yeah, drop yeah. shippers, hell, screw those people. <laughs> I, no, I was going to say, it's funny that you, yeah. your, your, your example includes uh, buying on walmart.com and shipping from Target. I mean, like if people got a Target box and not something from like way overseas, I think they'd actually be very happy. I mean, yeah. the issue with drop shipping was like, it was like yeah. AliExpress two months, months from later. today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two months, it wasn't. Three months later, it yeah. wasn't even Target. It was yeah, like yeah, yeah. it was no, really no, no. Bad even, for a while. even the Target thing is like it's not good, man. But in a way, in a way, though, what you're doing is you are a marketplace like Amazon because Amazon is a marketplace. Yep. They're not trying to be the market. Uh, they're trying to be the marketplace. They let everyone fight with each other when they supply them the space and sell. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a flea market or you mentioned a mall. I, I love that example where at the end the cashier is, is, is the flea market uh, person. He's the cashier. He collects the money. Then he distributes the money to the store owners. Yeah. And uh, that's a very controlled environment this way. They yeah. can control everything. Kind of like uh, if you watch the founder, well, well, you can own the land. Actually, you don't worry about flipping burgers. Yeah. And um, and then in in your case, you decide I don't want to own the thing because then I own the operation. I just want a little piece of a little bit of everything, and I can put the money out there. And it's a, it's what a traditional fund does. Now you have right now thirty seven million under management, which is extremely impressive for someone your age. Uh, and I can imagine when you're going to be my age, how much you're going to have under management. Completely different money, probably. Thirty-seven billion. 37 <laughs> yeah, because right billion. now, right now, I see you doing a lot of um, kind of like hunting for kind of like the search for the holy grails. There's like an opportunity over here, but it's it's scalable to a point, but not. It's not going to be something that Bain Capital is going to go and tell you, hey, here's some of our money. It's Let's definitely move alternative the, stuff. Yeah, it's alternative, right? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts of kind of like a massive volume, but sm maybe perhaps? Hopefully, smaller returns. But do you have any thoughts of something a hundred million, uh, five hundred million plus investments? Not like nitpicking a couple cars here and there, something bigger scale. Yeah. So something that I'd like to move more into, and I've I've kind of talked to my legal team and um, trying to get a fund set up because there's two areas that I see massive growth in. Um, number one is obviously the Forex, okay. right? So we already have scaled that. We've proven the model that I believe is scalable way past where we're at right now. We could do hundreds of millions. We could probably do billions in the Forex space, right? Obviously it'd have to be like partitioned into different accounts, but very possible. Now, besides that, what I see really, really picking up is um, specifically right now, last mile shipping. Mm -hmm. So, or yeah, last yes. mile shipping. So when a semi truck DDU. comes, yeah. yeah, when a semi truck comes to Miami, the semi truck isn't dropping off the box at your house. They bring it to a warehouse, which mm -hmm. is the last mile warehouse. From there, a sprinter takes it to your house, right? Or a little box truck or something. So if I can invest into those last mile facilities, that's a great investment right now specifically because we're not going to have unlimited space, especially in big cities. And so that's a great market that's really, really growing. So real estate, I believe, overall is like the holy grail, right? Multifamily, large commercial properties right now. Wait, when you're saying last mile, usually the last mile process goes to USPS, is that what you refer to? So it's, USPS no. has the DDU, which is it means the last mile, the last destination unit, and that, um, yeah. and what they're doing is you ship to them to their facilities. It's a government facility, and in order for you to cut the cost, you drop the products from California, you from here to Calif from Miami to California. You just take yeah. a truck. This way, you you pay a completely different fee if yeah. you have a certain volume that they require. Is that what you refer to? Um, it can be something like USPS. It can be a government thing, but it can also be like Amazon, right? Amazon, a lot of times, has their own contractors that deliver all these things. Yes. So you go to the Amazon warehouse. So like an Amazon warehouse would be a potential investment. You build the facility, they buy it from you or they invest in it or they're leasing it, whatever, right? So those are in very high demand right now. There's also less like less volume facilities uh, where semi trucks come and they unload their loads and it's distributed by smaller vehicles not like amazon size but shipping in general is an industry that i'm looking so into you would find you'd find one of those contractors and you would augment their fleet is what you're saying no with, i'm with talking the about trucks? the real estate 
Oh, the real. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so you sorry, own sorry. the warehouse. Okay, okay. gotcha. Yeah. Got so you. the warehouse itself is a good okay. investment because I've seen them appreciate a lot, um, specifically in large cities where there's a lot of demand for it. As we're moving more to buying stuff online, I believe there's a huge shift towards e-commerce, and it's just grown and grown and grown, and that means that we're going to need more infrastructure for that. So that's a big target for me in real estate right at this moment. It's not going to be like that forever, but right now it's a hot time. Um, but overall, I'd say multifamily, um, hotels, commercial real estate, that's something that I believe is sustainable into the billions. Yeah, that's, uh, it is something. There is actually a, uh, a REIT that does that uh, called Harry's. Uh, they start with Are you in that? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, and it's only on commercial uh, commercial real estate and it's yeah. only Amazon Walmart fulfillment centers yeah and that's uh, and it has been appreciating it's nothing the same kind of but, but I think it's a nine billion dollar fund um, and you can you can uh, probably research that it's uh, it's an interesting and they are appreciating by far more than anything else I mean I have some with other REITs and it, it is, it's the best investment. But that's so, a not, so you're putting your money into a $9 billion fund. So what you're saying is would you start a REIT yourself and raise that fund and sort of act as sort of kind of like exactly what he's put money into? Um, I don't know if it would be a real estate specific fund. So I think that right now, I really like how I balanced my portfolio. Of course, I'm a little it's bit It's just a biased. good concept. That's the that's whole point. He can do yeah. it through different I can yeah. scale it. So whether I have a fund that's diversified into Forex and real estate and all I these see. other things, and maybe we own you know, 20 yachts, right, and private jets and all this stuff, and it's just a fund of funds, or yeah. I have individual funds into each one, right? So it really just depends on how I want to I was just more play. curious where you, what you wanted to do. I know there's a million different, like, different ways to do it, but like what you yeah, actually yeah. felt like doing with it. So how, how does it feel like being single, <laughs> successful in Seattle, which is gray most of the year? And no one, no one to pay for coffee. Yeah, I mean, you have to drink coffee to stimulate yourself and not be depressed from the gray clouds over there. Uh, how does it feel? I mean, you, you sit down on a date with a girl and you tell her, listen, let me tell you about Forex. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? <laughs> That's usually not how I start the conversation. No, I, I recommend you shouldn't or you might stay single. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great way to stay single. No. <laughs> No, it's, um, you know, no, Seattle's great. I like Seattle. It's a nice little, I kind of consider it my quiet corner of the United States. I can go there. It's not hectic. It's not crazy. And if I want crazy, I can just travel. Mm. Right. And I travel a lot. about Miami too. You hear that? Yeah. Yeah, A little subtle state. uh, We live in Fort Lauderdale. This is not crazy over here. So (laughs) Fort Lauderdale is not crazy. No, but I think, you know, there's a lot of excitement in Miami, but I think there's also value in like a quieter setting. Um, because it allows me to focus on my business and grow that business. And that takes up a lot of my time. You know, I'm really passionate about coaching people and helping them achieve that aha moment of their investment career where they're like, oh, I can buy a semi truck and make money off of it. What? I can do oil wells and this is how it works and this is how much you're making. To help people make that realization, I believe will pay them for the rest of their life. So you're charging them for, uh, for your school? Yeah, so I charge 40K for 12 months. Okay. Um, and they join weekly calls where I'm coaching them through this entire process. And they can literally take my portfolio piece by piece and copy exactly what I'm doing. It's, it's pretty impressive. And you give them like all the contacts and, and whatnot. Absolutely. And- yeah, so I'm kind of like the connector. They come yeah, to I me. That. I teach them how these investments work. Let's say they choose two or three of them. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, instead of you going out, I'm going to teach you how to do it on your own. But instead of doing it on your own, why don't I just connect you with the guy that's doing it for me? Yeah. He's already successful. This is how much money he makes me every single month. Here, here's his is it worth it for you, though, to go and teach the secret sauce of what you do? Yeah. I mean, it's not really secret sauce. It's just the way I like to do it. You know, I think there's multiple ways to do anything. And for me, I'm passionate about the educational side of it. For me, I make my own passive income whether I have students or not, mm-hmm. right? And so to be able to share that with the community, I'm really passionate about that. If I was making, I was telling him really, if I was making a billion dollars a day in passive income, I would still be coaching people because I love walking people through that process because I believe that is a transformational process that's going to pay them for the rest of their life. It's not a one-time thing. It's like, oh, I made this guy $100,000. No, I taught them a system that's going to produce six figures over and over and over and over change someone's life yeah have you okay so what's the percentage of people that ended up quitting their job and start doing good for themselves so we have basically a guideline where we follow uh 
we follow a system that produces six figures in passive income. So the minimum per month is about $8,300. We have a 100% success rate. So I guarantee that that's going to happen for them within 12 months. If not, then I work with them one-on-one -on -one to make sure it does. So that okay. ensures a 100% success rate, good. essentially. 100K right? in passive income. With yeah. I always compare this to traditional education where you go to a college. And so you, useless compared you're to just this. just complete useless. Well, with well I won't tell you, but I'm still in college. <laughs> yeah. You're in college? Yeah, I'm doing my, well, um, a postgrad. So I'm doing my PhD right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, in what? Uh, organizational leadership. Why? Just for fun. Okay. That, so, so next time you I come this, here, folks? I'll make your parents happy. Make your parents I'll happy. I'll be Dr. Austin you next time only, I come here. Yeah, Dr. Austin. <laughs> you can only make these crazy decisions like doing a PhD in business when you have so much passive income that you don't have to work anymore. That's it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I no, like, it's, it's good to keep learning, but, but candidly, traditional education, even though you are taking, a, you're doing a PhD right now, compared to teaching somebody how to make 100K without putting in... Yeah. 40 additional hours in their life is I'll tell you I'll tell so you why smart. I'll tell you why there's going to be a pushback for something like yours versus traditional because traditional you get government money no no one is the government just pays you to go to school for some odd reason which makes no sense uh, are the tax dollar payers that just waste their money it just it needs to be privatized if if a bank doesn't want to loan you money to go to school, then I guess it's not worth it because they know better than the government. And if you're telling me you want to be a doctor, eventually we know you're going to pay out your debt until you ran, all, you ran over by one of your trucks. But uh, <laughs> oh, no, aside no, no, no. of that, I mean, it makes, uh, if you go to business school like I did, it's completely useless. My uh, MBA was really not worthwhile. What did you learn from this that you can actually use? I mean, nothing. I, I, I knew most of this, actually, I knew probably 90% of the stuff going into my MBA. Because I took I, it later I, on in life. Too. I learned today more than uh, how to make money with you, more than what I've learned throughout the time that I took my bachelor Insane. in business. Uh, absolutely. What do you learn in a PhD of business? Can we get that on a quote? <laughs> it will be on yeah, a quote. Yeah, it yeah. will be. <laughs> Valentina. <pull> quote. <laughs> Valentina. Listen, when I, went, when, I was, when I was doing my bachelor, I had, I had my, my first company, which was a liquidation company. Yeah. And I was paying out of state tuition. So I was paying the full thing, right? The full thing. I had, I had a liquidation company, but because I did search engine optimization successfully, I had casino sites where I used to send traffic to casino sites and making commission. Plus, I had Google Ads and websites. So all combined, I was doing about 150000 a year from all those, all those little uh, gibberish little websites. Not including the liquidation, which was organized, and I had a warehouse with employees and all that. And I still had to go to school because I was an international student, and I had to stay in school, otherwise I, I lose my status. And one time, one of uh, the professors, uh, it was at the end of the career, it was, she was asking if anyone had any sort of business, and me and a couple other people raised our hands. Each one of them talked about their Amazon. or what. No, it wasn't Amazon. It was all eBay at the time. And then yeah. she asked me, and I said, well, I'll show you my my AdSense account. I didn't tell her about all the other affiliates and all those. And I had to go in and I showed her that I made 120, I mean, I showed her about 12,000 or 15,000 a month that I was making, that was a good month. But she looked, uh, I logged into my Amazon, my Google account, and she looked, she said, wait, you made 120,000 this year? I said, well, on this one, I also have the, gam the gambling sites and I have the affiliate sites, plus I have the liquidation site with just the big one. And she looked at me completely different because this, who the hell are you? And at that time, making that type of money, they were there teaching you how to make money and they were just teachers with tenure. They're not going to learn that. And you cannot replace them with someone like us that can teach them that. And you leave the class and you say, this is such an obsolete institution. Yeah, that I I was I was shocking my professor that was trying to teach us something. And then business yeah. professor trying to teach business. And that person doesn't get how you pull in an additional two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this person, this this professor could be. Do, they, they could be doing. They could be doing it too. Yeah. They could totally be doing it, right? Yeah. If Absolutely. they were doing it, probably they were teaching because they enjoy it, just like you want to learn because you they, enjoy it. This but one that obviously wasn't, wasn't. No, it wasn't, and none of them were. And like in in one respect, I would say it would be okay if you ask me if would I send my kids to school to, school to study business. I said, you know, if you're already going to study business, make sure it's an Ivy League school for the connections. Yeah. And that you, I'll pay a lot of money for. You'll pay the money. We'll pay them whatever it is, but. It's going to be for connections and around yeah. certain people. The rest is oh, just yeah. not worth it. Take something like engineering, 
um, be a doctor or something like that, where you learn a code and you actually have a job after that. Yeah. Miserable life, probably, because who the hell wants a job? But, I mean, that's just my world. But uh, in my world, I'll die if I have to take a job. But it's just the way I'm wired, and you guys are, obviously. But it's, it's something that looking at, you need to look at your face. And there is a big discrimination around the type of education you're providing. You can see, I've seen, um, I think it was a, CNA, a CNN piece where they were talking about all the scammers out there and they were showing Grant Cardone and so on and just putting it out there like they're teaching. No, they're doing better than what, they're teaching better education than what the traditional universities do for oh, a yeah. hundred years. Absolutely. No, that's, that's very, very true because, well, the one thing that I have gained from school, I'd say is discipline in teaching myself. So like through my MBA, through the PhD, one thing that I've learned is just disciplined, critical thinking, so to speak. So I take a project and I can analyze it pretty quickly. Now, one other thing that I think is very, very important, specifically in like your bachelor's degree, right, undergrad is learning different modes of thought. So can I solve a problem in a science frame of thought and uh, maybe, you know, psychological frame of thought, well, mathematical what did you do bachelor frame in? of thought, your bachelor in business and business and master yeah. MBA business. MBA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the thing that I liked about it is that different subjects allow you to analyze problems in different ways, right? Mathematical is very logical. It's very structured. Then if I'm doing something in science, well, now I have all these variables and it's more of a word problem. And so it teaches you to solve problems in different frames. And that's, I think, very valuable. But because doesn't, doesn't how you solve a problem. I think you're pushing it, it to, to, to try and give them some credit. I don't think. I no, I have, I have a serious question. No, no, no. Does, does, no. Your, does the lens at which you look at a problem not... Is that not uh, coming from your personality type? Because there are going to be more analytical individuals that solve problems mm -hmm. through data sets. There's going to be more yeah. uh, creative individuals. And there's different personality types. And whether or not it's a, a disk profile or um, any of the other ones. There's Enneagram. Like a million, yeah, yeah any, any of them. Like, are you saying that you actually try and control the lens at which you look at problems? Because I definitely didn't get that in my MBA, for sure. But I mean, like, I don't know that the PhD level maybe take another two years, but that's what, that's what yeah. I'm hearing from you. I don't know. I don't, I don't think you would have been less successful if you didn't go to school. I think you would have been just as successful. Um, it's not, it's just, yeah, it's just too generalist. I think, I think the problem I agree. here, it's too general. It is too if general. You, if you yes. were coming, the reason you're different is because you're giving specific information. Go in tomorrow, I'll tell you exactly what you're going to do within a week. This is where you're going to start seeing dollars in your account. It's a specific... Mm -hmm. application to what someone needs and that is what they don't have in in business school right other yeah. different but business school specifically yeah okay it is so general that that is not an important information just when you look at the at your chart and you say important and urgent and then you say how urgent and then you it's going to be a chart of four urgent important less important less urgent more important there is nothing about about that when you come down to the information that you receive from a place that they give you books that were printed, that were written two years ago, and all that information was already passé. That's it. It's just nothing that we've seen that have changed. Can you say there was value for it? Of course, because you learned. But was it important to what you did? Anything what you did? I don't know. I mean, you tell me. No, I think that's very true. The information had value, and that's what I was trying to say. But it's not urgent and not important. Yeah. Like I didn't specifically apply. And when I was doing that, I had already, you know, I'd already been in business around business. I kind of understood how it works. And so most of it was just like, oh, there's a theory that explains this. Or like, mm -hmm. oh, I've seen this before. Oh, it's actually a theory, you know? So it's like connecting the dots a little bit. But I wouldn't say it was anything I'm like, oh, let me apply this in my business right now. There was nothing that I found that was super applicable and super urgently needed in my business. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, we can keep talking bad about universities, but we're not going to do it. We're nice people. and uh, I, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get a university sponsor, though. So I'm just worried. About, we just can't talk bad about liquor. Yeah. We're just talking about business schools. Yeah. So don't. I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think Stanford's going to sponsor yeah. this podcast. Yeah, don't, don't, don't use that as, uh, as clips on Instagram. They'll have to go through the whole. Yeah. Um, anyways, no, that's, that's, that's amazing. Funny. So uh, we went through most of like the, the ways that you earn passive income, right? Yeah. We went through some of the failures and trying to think, is there anything else that we didn't go into that would be useful for somebody? Again, this, this, this whole talk is tailored towards somebody that, in my opinion, at least is stuck in a job is, is 
working nine to five, is entrepreneurial, they know they want to build something else, but they haven't started yet, they're scared, whatever. So what yeah. would you say to that person to eliminate that fear, to help them like take that first step? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things that I'd like to say. Number one is that really the only thing that's keeping you back from achieving everything you ever wanted in life is fear. And that's one quote that has really, really helped me do a lot of things because I know like, hey, if I want to get, you know, that business deal or if I want to buy that house, if I want to get that car, really the only thing that's stopping me is fear. It's not my skill level. It's not my education. Like if I just take fear out of the equation, I can go out and I can get those things. If I need the education, I can find somebody who knows what to do. If I need money, oh, I can find a way to go make that money. If I need access or a network, I can go out there and introduce myself. So really the only thing that's stopping me is fear. That's my only disadvantage. Okay, so if I take fear out of the equation, I can go and get all these things. Okay, now that we've established that, number two is people don't realize how much access there is to capital so easily. We're literally getting people hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment capital that they can use for these investments. Can we double down on that? Because money is a big uh, inhibitor to doing a lot of the things that yes, you're talking yes, about. absolutely. We have people that are joining our program like literally all they have is the 40K to join the program. And they're like, Austin, is this worth it? Like, is this really going to work? And I'm, every single time I say yes, because I know how easily we can access business capital, whether it's a prop firm giving you money to trade or whether it's an investor funding your deals or private financing or business credit cards at 0% interest or the business loans. Like there's so many sources that we use to get people capital. How do you get a business, uh, business loan for 0% in today's world? Very easy. They use projected income and there's a lot of um, business credit cards that'll give you 0% introductory APR. Mm. So I've literally had people get two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 on these credit cards. Obviously not all one card and not one bank. This is like maybe seven to 10 yeah. cards. Yeah. Right? But, and but by the way, you're not, you're not buying a $10 million asset either. No, you no. May, absolutely. You may only need, I, I don't know, like maybe you need 100K, 200K, 300K. You can buy a house. You can way. realistically make six figures with like $30,000, $40,000. Because think of it like this, if you just got approved for 50K across all the cards that we applied for, using all the senior vice presidents at Bank of America and Chase and US Bank and all these connections and all these projected incomes and everything, and all that comes out of it is 50K. Well, let's buy you a Lambo and let's send it to New York because those tend to do 10 to $15,000 a month. Is that six figures? Yes. So we've achieved your six figure goal. You're profitable. That's how I can have a guarantee in my program because I know, hey, worst case scenario, there's like two or three investments that I know hit every single time. And I can just put you in one of those investments and fulfill on my promise to you. So if you want to get more creative and you want to start buying like Airbnb arbitrage and like all these other things, we can do it and we can build out a whole system. But I know that at the end of the day, if we need to hit six figures quickly, there's a couple of go to strategies that I have. So getting access to capital is one thing. And obviously, the more capital you have, the less you can risk or the less you have to risk, because if you're playing with two hundred thousand dollars, you just need a 50% return to make six figures. You don't need to target 34 or sorry, like 60, 70, 100, 200% returns. If you're playing with 50K, then yeah, you need a 200% return. So we really, really emphasize getting access to as much capital as you possibly can and then utilizing that in a smart way that diversifies your risk but still produces a good return. It's smart. I it's love very it. smart. I love it. Yeah. The, um the, the concept of that would never be taught again in universities. Go and get a credit card with no, zero percent not. APR. That would if, not if Dave Ramsey's then, listening, yeah. he's like, <laughs> Dave Ramsey's turn it off, turn it turning, off. <laughs> turning in his See, remember what I told you before? Dave Ramsey does not speak about investment strategy. He speaks yeah. about he speaks about limiting your spending, paying off debts. You, yeah. Alex Ramsey, right? Like, Dave Ramsey. No, Dave, Dave Ramsey. Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And a lot. And of I have people, nothing against Dave Ramsey, but yeah. my point is, if you if you're smart with your money, and everybody who you know this, you know that if you're smart with your money, it doesn't make sense to pay off your credit cards if you can have like a a, a thirty to fifty percent. ROI monthly or whatever no, that your numbers makes no are. Sense, yeah. Yeah. And here's what I have to say about that. And you'll I end debt, up paying your credit cards anyway. Yeah. So debt <laughs> itself has no meaning. It's not a positive, it's not a negative word. We can assign meaning to it. So if I want debt to be good, I can make it good. If I want to make it bad, I can make it bad. Dave, he's a good guy and he has an audience because a lot of people use debt incorrectly. They get a ten thousand dollar credit card. They go to the Gucci store and buy a new tracksuit. Well, now, first of all, you just paid ten grand for a tracksuit, and you're also paying interest on top of that. Yeah. But I took that ten k <coughs> and I invested it, 
and I got myself two Airbnb arbitrage properties and I'm netting $4,000 a month. I don't care what my interest rate is. I'm making way more I, I money. I guess the, the, the challenge for people and not for him specifically, for people uh, <clears throat> that are very conservative, they would think of doomsday, assuming everything fall apart. Yeah. That car is no nobody wants to ever rent cars anymore. It, it's just not a thing from one day to another. Yeah. And now you're stuck with a car that depreciated automatically. And now you're stuck with the debt and you don't have the money to pay the debt because you borrow more than you have and all that. So they'll think of a doomsday without understanding that, you know, mathematically, if you put it into numbers, it would be 0. 0.0000 whatever. Percent one, and then that would have yeah. never happen. It's just easier to get struck by lightning before that happens. And um, <laughs> And that's the reason for most people where they... They wouldn't go for that. Exactly. Because I think you've yeah. been, I think it's funny. A society has actually like brainwashed people to be okay buying all this bullshit, but not be okay taking on risk of actual investment. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I mean, you, even if you buy a car, that is a depreciating asset and you need, maybe you need that car. But my point is like, it's okay to buy a car. It's okay to buy a depreciating asset. It's okay to buy luxury goods but it's not okay to put a $10,000 business investment or $20,000 business investment on a credit card. People yeah. already have $20,000 in credit card debt. Why wouldn't that be business? Yeah. Why would that be? Yeah, there are many, many uh, one-liners running around. If you can buy it twice, don't buy it. It, it, it needs to be more specific like for your own luxury goods, for something for yourself. It, it yeah. doesn't, yeah, because it might confuse some and it yeah. needs to be more explicit than just a one-liner. But it's strange because people have no problem going and twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt is actually light. People are going fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they yeah. own nothing that makes them money. Exactly, which blows the, my mind. The statistic I think in two thousand and seven was that if you have twenty five thousand dollars in credit card debt, the average expectancy uh, payment expectancy would be seventy five years. Twenty five thousand dollars. I'll say it again. Seventy five years. I'll say yes. Seventy five wow. years. If you have twenty five, that was in two thousand and seven. So obviously back then twenty five thousand was more like, who knows what today. Um, but let's just say fifty. So it would take seventy five years, statistically in average to pay. So some people don't, but that's a small percentage. Majority would take them seventy five years because they're not leveraging that for business. They're leveraging this for anything they don't need. And I think that education part is partly where we failed in, uh, in society where we feel like the government has to take away from those who make because we don't know how already, to make yeah, we don't We don't know how to make it ourselves, so just take it for some, and, and instead of modified, and just instead of giving us some education how to actually make it. You can't it be ignorant either, so you have to say, okay, yeah. so at least like some people, yes, there's some people that do not have the additional capital. But for the people that do have the additional capital, what you're talking about is cash flowing businesses that you're buying fractional pieces of, very smart, as opposed to buying stocks and praying that they go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Because what do you do when you buy a stock? It's not cash flowing. Some pay dividends for sure. But I mean, we're talking about actually buying businesses with historical data, the cash flow. Yeah, in my opinion, that's a smarter decision. And again, no, no the caveat you're, you're, is no you're hear advice. Warren Buffett <laughs> yeah, yeah. arguing with you now about stocks. He's going to go and tell you that he buys businesses that happen to be traded. Warren Buffett buys cash flowing businesses. They just no, happen does, to be does, stocks. Yeah, yeah they yeah. just happen to Trust, be Trust, he made how much? <clears throat> what was it? $800 million in on dividends Coca -Cola from Coca-Cola? Yeah. Yeah. He buys cash flowing businesses that pay out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not all of them, but he believes that yes. in their future. Yeah, so. so now you're just buying yeah, a cash flowing yeah. business that instead of pays out quarterly or annual dividends, it's it's cutting you a check. Yeah, it's a it's a rev share on a product versus a dividend. Yeah. Anyways, well, okay. so you have a you have a drive today, right? You came over and yeah. really <laughs> really appreciate that. It was great meeting you. I think that uh, we definitely too. came out smarter from this. Um, I know you, I did. You. I know smart uh, Scott is already very smart, so I don't <laughs> made any dent in that. Yeah. But uh, for me, absolutely, I, I'm glad you came over. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. And uh, next time we see you over here, we're going to go grab some uh, steaks. We're going to go to Puppy Steak. There's no sponsorship okay. over here. It's just <laughs> a <friend. laughs> no, we're gonna He's like, Puppy Steak is like biggest fan. It is, okay, it most, is the most best important. Place. Most important. Um, where do people go to connect with you? Where do people go find out more? Um, all the socials, yeah. all the website. Yeah, Instagram is the best place. So it's going to be Austin Zellin. 
um, at Austin Zellin. And then also my website is austinzellin.com. So pretty simple, but I basically treat my Instagram as a landing page. So all my investment updates, like next week when I'm at the oil wells, I'm going to be posting pictures of the oil wells and stuff. So uh, very excited for that. But um, I use that as like my main feed of everything that I'm doing and new investments that pop up and updates and stuff like that. So. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Perfect. man. I appreciate you. That was okay. great. Awesome. Thank Go you ahead. so much. Cheers. Thank you. All right, brother.